Uh, there's just so much stuff to set up for each lecture. Sorry about that. Um, so just a, a reminder, I'll keep reminding you, at least for the first few weeks of the semester, I'll have the Discord lecture channel open uh, during lecture. I'll be watching it. Sup, Rosanna? Sup, Nicholas? Uh, I don't see where, there you are. What's up? Um, so if you have questions, I don't believe Quinn is in the room, but hi, Quinn. Um, so if you have questions during lecture, feel free to post in the Discord lecture channel or do the old-fashioned raise your hand, ask me a question that way. That's cool, too. All right, so on Monday, we introduced the course, talked about what we're doing here, uh, what we're doing this semester, kind of a very quick overview. Now it's time to get into some content. Uh, homework one is already released. It's posted on the course website. You just saw me click the link. In case you missed it, it's right at the top of each section is going to be the link to the homework. So once we're done with homework one with these three weeks, week four, this link will be active. I'll post homework two before the week, before week four Monday starts. I'll post homework two and so on for all four homeworks. So for the next three weeks or two and a half, I guess, uh, since it's already Wednesday, we're going to learn how to do homework one. I won't go through the whole assignment right now, but I just want to give a quick overview at least of what we're going to be learning in the next three weeks and how we're going to get this homework done. So this homework is all about HTTP and Docker. Hopefully the Docker won't be too bad. Um, do, uh, next week we have multiple lectures on Docker. Um, it's one of those things that either works perfect and you spend like five minutes on, or you have some weird error with your machine that it takes a while. Um, but mostly HTTP, hopefully for most of you, it takes like five minutes to do the Docker stuff. It's an HTTP homework. So once you get Docker set up, I'll table that for next week. I'll save that for next week. Uh, building the HTTP, uh, building HTTP server from a TCP socket. All of the homeworks are starting with a TCP socket, and then you're building the HTTP part. That's most of what you're doing for this homework is using HTTP, building a web server that speaks HTTP and handles a variety of requests. The first one, why did that? My screen went blank here. At least the projector caught it. Um, the first one is strictly hello world. We always love to start here with anything in computer science, so why not? Uh, getting a request, a get request for the path hello, should return some welcoming message. You're welcome to use hello world or whatever you want. A redirect and a 404. And then hosting an entire page, objective two. Each homework, by the way, will be five objectives all equally weighted. Uh, objective two of the entire semester is hosting an entire website with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Then just more things, hosting images, and then adding paths for what we call a RESTful API, which is going to store user records. Uh, for that one, we're going to use a database. That's when we're going to start talking about Docker next week. Uh, Docker gives a nice way to set up a database uh, that's pretty painless as long as everything goes smooth. So we'll talk about all that. So for today's lecture, what we want to talk about is what is HTTP? I'm going to give a, a brief overview of most of what you need to know about HTTP. And then in the subsequent lectures, I'm going to zoom in on each topic, uh, most of the topics anyway, and go in depth about each topic. So today, it'll be a lot of different content um, that'll go fairly quick. But we will go back for some of them, uh, most of these topics, and explain them in depth. Anything you need to do on your homework, you're going to see again. Today is going to be an overview of the entire protocol. So let's uh, so let's do it. Yeah, it's. Uh, oh, you are in the room, Quinn. Hi, Quinn. I don't think we've actually. I don't know if we've actually met. I hear about you, uh, but. Uh, yeah, and uh, in the chat, if you are talking about something that has nothing to do with lecture, that's fine. Just get it in the lecture off topic channel. There's another topic there. So if you just want to uh, share memes and, and BS during lecture with everybody else in the class, uh, just keep that in lecture off topic. Uh, just because when there's like a big flashy meme, uh, which, you know, uh, we like to post during lecture. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it just catches my eye, and then I get distracted, and I'm staring at my phone while everybody's staring at me, wondering what I'm doing. Uh, so just to avoid awkward things like that, where I'm just staring at my phone going, what is going on here? 
Um, just keep the off-topic stuff in the off-topic. Then if you have a question specifically for me or something about the lecture content, get it in the lecture channel. Did somebody ask where the website is? Goodness gracious. Uh, <laughs> um, everything you need to know about this course is on the website. So the answer to that question is always on the website. All right, let's get to it. Uh, so what we covered very briefly on Monday, which again is content that you, you should know, you should be aware of IP and TCP, but it's not something you'll have to code in this class. If you're interested in those topics and diving way deep into them and being tested on them and applying them on your homework assignments, Modern Networking Concepts is the course for you. Taking that course, we have quite a few networking courses. This course, 370, which I talked about a bit on Monday, and Modern Networking Concepts. If you take those three courses, you really have a pretty good understanding of how the internet works and how websites work and, and uh, how we use the internet. We're not going to talk about TCP or IP anymore in this class. You're going to use libraries that are going to do all the TCP IP stuff for you. That three-way handshake we talked about, dropped packets and having requesting resends for dropped packets, sequence numbers, all that TCP stuff, uh, IP addresses, routing, all the IP stuff. None of that is anything you have to do in this course. You're going to say import library that does it for me and then tell that library to do it for you. And uh, I'll give an example in Python at the end of this lecture. It's one of the things I was just messing with. It's import socket server and socket server dot run forever. That's it. That's all you need to do. Um, and, uh, and it's different in other languages. In Node, in, uh, require net. And then net, do your thing. I forget the exact command for that one. Um, but you don't have to worry about the TCP or IP stuff. But as a quick overview, IP is how we route things through the internet, and TCP is how we make the internet reliable. IP is an unreliable protocol. It does not guarantee that your packets will uh, be received at the other end. TCP kind of does. If it's not received, there's a way to detect that and then request a resend. So it gives us reliable communication over an unreliable network which is usually the internet, is usually what we care about. But T P TCP could be used, not on the internet, but we're usually concerned about the internet. It's freaking 2022. It, the internet's the main thing that we do um, in networking. So what we want to focus on in this course, what you're actually going to have to code after you import that TCP library, HTTP. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time. We'll introduce WebSockets later on, uh, which starts with HTTP still. Uh, but most of what we do is fundamentally uh, built upon HTTP. So let's talk about what this is. So we get our IP packet. That's the only thing that we can send over the internet. And then the data contained in that packet is going to contain all your TCP information. And then the body of a TCP, pack, a TCP message is going to contain all of our HTTP information. And then finally, the body of the HTTP response is going to be the actual content that we're interested in. So we, the network, uh, the internet is layers and layers of networks. Uh, this is about as far in depth as I'll go in the network stack, but there's a, it's a deep topic. All these layers have different names and alternate protocols. We could use UDP instead of TCP, for example. Uh, there's, uh, we could use FTP instead of HTTP. We can swap out these protocols. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. Another thing you talk about in modern networking concepts. This is as far as I'm going to go. I'm just going to say the network stack is a thing, and that's how we get to HTTPs. That's how we use those cables that we have wrapped around the planet to be able to speak HTTP, and then we pick it up from HTTP. So what is HTTP? HTTP is a request response protocol, and it's an application layer protocol. Uh, application layer means that our applications that we write as software engineers care about this protocol. Our software, our applications, don't care about TCP or IP. Those are more operating system level protocols, or uh, in IP's case, the router level protocols. Application layers, the applications we write care about HTTP, HTTP and need to speak HTTP. <laughs> Toldfish. Oh, Toldfish, you might actually be in this class. Toldfish crashes all my lecture chats, but you might actually be in here. 
so, uh, so this is where we actually care about things. Uh, this is where we want to, to use it. Um, I put almost here, but I'm, I, I think HTTP always uses TCP. It's, that's what makes sense to me. I, I hedged my bets and put almost, um, but I'm pretty sure HTTP is always communicated over TCP. Um, if you use UDP for this, uh, things, would, things would get bad quickly. And HTTP, just like TCP, just like IP, is a, an agreed upon protocol. Uh, protocols, it's probably a word you've heard quite a bit. It's a word I'll use in this class a lot. And a big part of what we do in this class is dispel magic. Like the internet seems like it works off of magic, but really it works off of protocols. And all protocols are, are an agreed upon way of communicating. For example, we're using the English protocol right now. I'm just making a bunch of noises with my mouth, but I make those noises in a very specific way that you can understand what they are because I'm speaking in English. HTTP, TCP, IP, same thing. We're just sending ones and zeros over the, uh, over the internet. But with these protocols, we're assigning very meaningful values, or very meaningful ways in how those ones and zeros are structured and ordered in a way that if both the sender and receiver are speaking the same protocol, we can effectively communicate. It's all protocols are, is saying, what do these ones and zeros mean? OK, for IP, the first four ones and zeros are the version number, and, and uh, these ones and zeros are going to be the destination IP, et cetera. For TCP, these uh, ones and zeros here are going to be, uh, are going to be the sequence number. Uh, these numbers here, these ones and zeros, are going to be the length of the packet, et cetera. Uh, HTTP, same thing. It's a specific order, uh, except HTTP is a little bit different than the other two in that HTTP deals with a lot of string parsing. This course is, uh, has been called by many, including some of our TAs, uh, advanced string parsing. You're going to do a lot of string parsing with HTTP. Uh, it, that's how the protocol is written. It looks for specific characters and parses based on those characters to be able to extract information out of this. So as long as the browser speaks HTTP properly, the browser is going to send HTTP requests to our server. And if your server that you write for your homework is, is written properly and speaks the protocol properly, implements the protocol properly, you're going to be able to send information back to the browser and be able to load your website. So that's what we want to do. That's the first. Uh, first objective of this course is to write a server that can speak at least basic HTTP. Uh, HTTP. And this is a request response protocol. HTTP, your server, doesn't do anything ever at all unless it gets a request from a client. So we say there's a client and a server. The client has to make a request from the server, and the server responds with a response. In our cases, most of the time, the browser is going to be your client. It's going to make an HTTP request to your server, and your server is going to process that request and respond with an HTTP response. If you don't get a request, you don't send a response. Simple as that. HTTP is a very reactionary protocol, request, response, that must happen. You can't just send information to the browser. For that, we're going to talk about WebSockets. And there are things like polling we, we'll talk about briefly, um, which kind of manipulates the request response model a little bit to get, um, to get different features. But HTTP request response protocol. When you get a request, it might take a lot of requests to host a website. If you go to and I'll do it at the, the end of the lecture here. Um, you might have a lot of requests. If you ever go to a website, open up your browser console, which you should do. If you've never done that, you should do it a lot this semester. Uh, open up your browser console, go to the network tab, and refresh the page. Look at how many requests. Each line on that is a separate HTTP request. Look how many requests it takes to load a modern website. It'll be dozens for any modern website these days. Any, uh, anything with features. Maybe not like cc312.com, because I'm not doing much with that. Um, but go to like Google and look at how many requests it takes. It's a lot. So you might have a lot of requests to host a website. And each of those requests 
are handled in complete isolation. Uh, this is one of the first things that trips students up. Uh, on objective two, you're building a website that hosts HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in an image, but you don't do that until objective three on the homework. So you have three files that you have to serve. So when somebody requests your website, there's three files you have to send. So how do you send three files to the browser? Well, you don't. You just don't. You send one file. You send the HTML file in your response. I'm going to jump ahead in my slide, because I'm explaining this page without having it on there, this slide. The browser is going to request your HTML. And you're going to just send your HTML. Somebody requests HTML or the root path. They just didn't type any uh, path. You're going to give them your HTML. Here it is. Here's my HTML. When the browser parses that HTML, inside that HTML, there's going to be a style tag. It's going to say, hey, you need this CSS. There's going to be a script tag, which says, hey, you need this JavaScript file. When the browser reads those two lines, parses those from your HTML, it parses the style and says, oh, I need this CSS file. It's going to make another HTTP request for your CSS. You're going to uh, serve another HTTP response with your CSS. It's going to read the script tag and say, oh, I need this JavaScript file. It's going to make another request for that JavaScript file. And you're going to serve up that uh, JavaScript file in the subsequent response. And then the browser is going to say, oh, there's an image tag. And if you have objective three done, it's going to make a request for flamingo.jpg. And you're going to respond with the bytes for flamingo.jpg. So there will be four requests to make that page load. And when you're writing your server, you just write your code to be able to handle any of those four requests. And you don't connect them at all. When somebody requests your HTML, yeah, you know they're going to be sending three more requests, but you don't care. You're not going to link those together and say, oh, this user needs four files. You don't think ahead. The server is very, very basic in that sense. I don't know the right word for that. But uh, it's very simple, I'll say. I get a request, I serve a response. And then I don't think ahead. I don't look in the past. Very short-term memory. Uh, stateless is what we call it. It's a stateless protocol where we don't care that the same person just made these four requests. We're just going to say, I host HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and an image. You can request any of these, or none of them, or two of the four. The server doesn't care. Is there a question? So if you have five in each tag, you do HTML. That mm -hmm. means five, like your browser would have to send requests to the rest of the five tags. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you, and if you go to a site that has a lot of images, might as well just do it right now. Then we don't have to do it at the end. Just try Google. So if you go to inspect element, this will bring up the browser console. This will be your best friend throughout the semester. The browser console gives you tons of information about what's going on on the website that you're currently visiting. If you go to the network tab, you can see all of the HTTP requests that are sent to load this page. I don't care what's new, Google. So if I refresh this, it looks like I have other requests anyway, but sometimes you have to refresh. Uh, each line is a separate HTTP request that's sent to get this page to load. So the first one is going to be for the HTML. We're going to have a bunch of HTML that's um, minified, so it's formatted. You know in an unreadable way. But then each time there's something in that HTML that says, you need an image, you need some CSS, you need some JavaScript, you need some extra content, you need some authentication, that's going to be another request. So we send all these requests to Google just to be able to load this one page. So if there's 20 images on the page, that's at least 20 extra requests for each image. You're not going to send the server, the browser doesn't send a request that says, I need these 20 images. It sends 20 separate requests, one for each image. Oh, come on. I got I to gotta relearn all my shortcuts. There we go. So when you're writing your server, 
You're going to handle each one of those requests independently. You don't care that this user is going to send four requests. You just handle each of the four separately. And if the server, if the browser never sends the fourth request, you know, whatever. Your server doesn't care. So your server is software that speaks HTTP and will listen on a TCP, listen for TCP connections. So somebody's going, a browser's going to connect via TCP socket and then send you bytes that are HTTP requests, and you're going to respond with HTTP responses. Once you write software that does that, you wrote yourself a web server, and you can start serving content on the internet uh, using these protocols. Uh, we have a little bit of terminology here, the front end versus back end. Um, if you haven't heard these terms before, uh, front end is anything, um, I was going to say this is a little oversimplification, but I, I don't think it is yet even. Uh, front end is anything that runs in the browser. Back end is anything that runs on the server. So anything that's part of the front end, your users actually download onto their machine and run all that code, parse the HTML, parse the CSS, run the JavaScript. All of that's happening on the user's machine. When I visited Google, I downloaded their entire front end from their server and ran their front end on my machine. The back end is the server. That's everything that stays in Google's warehouse, Google's uh, data centers. All of that code, anything that runs, you know, their algorithm, uh, all, all, the, all the fancy stuff, the, uh, the databases, all of that is the back end. That's the server side. For this course, we're focused on back end. We don't care too much about the front end in this course. Uh, again, the front end, if you're interested in what runs in the browser, CC 370, Human Computer Interaction, is the course for you. Go take that course. It's fantastic. Uh, Alan does a great job with it. Go take that and learn the other half of, uh, of web development. If you can do both of these, we call you a full stack developer for what it's worth. Um, when you do both, it's full stack, uh, aside from front end and back end. So an HTTP request can have many different types, which we'll talk about. Uh, to start, we'll talk about get. I'll start sprinkling in post. And then in two weeks, the third week of homework one content, we'll talk about put and delete on top of that. Uh, we may talk about head later in the semester. Uh, I don't have any content in the course as of last semester, but it's something I want to add. So we may or may not see, uh, see head. But it is important. Head is an important thing for a very specific security reason, uh, which we may talk about. So with get, we want to get or request information from a server. With post, we want to send information to a server. Uh, those are the two we'll focus on, at least for now, for, uh, for this week. So get request, give me some information. This is most of your. Uh, you just give me content requests. Uh, if you ever type in a URL into the address bar in your browser, you're making a get request. It's always going to be a get request. All the subsequent, most of the subsequent requests, getting all the static content, as we call it, the HTML, the CSS, the JavaScript, the images, any multimedia content, all get requests. Give me this information. Server, you got information. You got data. I want your bytes. Give me that information. Post is when you want to send something to the server. So whenever you fill out a form, typically that's going to create a post request. You're going to send a post request to the server saying, hey, server, I got some information for you. Here it is. Do whatever you do with this information. Usually uh, will involve a database at some point. The server is going to store that in a database, respond with some uh, information for you specific to the data that you sent. Um, you know, if you're filling out a form to buy something, if you're adding something to your cart uh, on, uh, on Amazon or something, it's going to be a post request. Hey, here's some information. I want to buy this thing. Um, do what you do with this information. Every request is going to be for a specific resource on the internet. To identify a resource, we use a URL, a uniform resource locator. This is universal, like even outside of the internet. We want, um, there was a need for a very specific format to be able to request any resource pretty much ever. 
Uh, and this is the structure of those formats, we have, uh, which you should be at least uh, pretty familiar with. Uh, but I want to talk about all the parts of this. Uh, this has different parts, protocol. What protocol are we using? For our purposes, for this course, that's almost always going to be HTTP. But this could be anything. It could be FTP. It could be a file. If you just open an HTML file on your machine, uh, a local file, this protocol will be the file protocol. You're just opening a file, and then the path is uh, where that file is on your machine. Colon slash slash, the host. Typically, this is a domain name. When you're testing your servers, this will be localhost, which means this machine. I want to connect to this machine right here. Uh, I don't need to go out to the internet using an IP address. I just want to talk to my own device. Uh, this could also be a domain name. If it's a domain name, there's going to be a DNS request to get the IP address, and then a request for that IP address will be sent. The port number. This you may not have seen before, because most of the time, as a user of the internet, we don't have to care about port numbers. When you're developing, you're going to have to worry about these port numbers, though. So the port number is the, F, the, uh, 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 the TCP port that you want to connect to. So TCP introduces the idea of ports. I very briefly mentioned it on Monday. Uh, the port is just a number. That's it. It's, all, it's just a number. Uh, the port is a number which identifies which process should care about this request. So I can, on my laptop, I can open up my browser, and I can have 10 different tabs that are connecting, um, connecting to 10 different servers. And with all of those servers, I'm speaking TCP to all 10 of them. So when my, uh, when my network card gets a an HTTP response, which to my network card, it's just a, uh, to my laptop outside of my application, that's just a TCP response or just an IP response, depending on what's listening to it. Or a TCP, no, TCP for my example, to make my example work. It's just a TCP response. So how does it know which of those 10 tabs to send that response to? I might have all 10 of these tabs loading at the same time and getting all these TCP packets from 10 different servers all getting mixed in together. Well, they're routed by their port number. They're going to be sent to a specific port. Each tab is going to have a different port number. And then my operating system is going to route traffic based on the port number. Because of this, only one application can be using a port number at a time. You can't have an application that uses multiple, uh, you can't have multiple applications using the same port number simultaneously, because then your operating system doesn't know which application, which process specifically, which process to send TCP traffic to when it gets information on that port number. How's it going to know which application it's for? Could be for either of them. So we use the port number to specify which application. By default, HTTP is always going to be on port 80 for the server. If I send something to a host using HTTP and I don't have a port number, port 80. If I use HTTPS, it's going to default to 443. So most of the time, as users, we don't have to care about these port numbers. Uh, we just send information, and uh, uh, based on the protocol, it routes to the proper port. When you're writing your server on the homework, I'm going to require you to listen on port 8080 to when you set up your, uh, set up your uh, Docker file and Docker Compose. So when you go to your browser, you will have to put localhost colon 8080 for the port. Yeah, put is. Uh, adding information to a service put. The big difference between put and post is if you send multiple identical put requests, there, there won't be any change on the server when you send the second one. Uh, it's, I believe, item potent is, is the term for that. Uh, if you send multiple post requests, there's no guarantee that you're going to have, uh, that the server won't change state twice if you send two identical requests. With put, there is a guarantee. So that's our way of communicating as developers. If you label something as a put request, you're saying if you send multiple put requests that are identical, the second one doesn't do anything. There's no change on the server. But multiple put re uh, post requests, hey, I want to buy this. Hey, I want to buy it again. You're going to buy it twice. If it's two put requests, I want to add this to my cart. I want to add this to my cart. That's saying you're only adding it to your cart once, the way the server is coded. Uh, there's nothing in the protocols forcing you to do that. It's just being consistent as developers. 
and labeling your request types appropriately. If you label it put, you should have that feature, that add and potent feature. Uh, so that's a big difference. Okay, next is path. This is this specific recourse, uh, resource that's being requested. And you're, and you're going to let me get away with the 10 browser tabs? What's the port number of each tab? Are they all 80? Uh, if you all let me get away with that one, I won't explain that one. But, uh, the path is going to be the specific uh, resource that's being requested. For your homework, the first one is slash hello. That's saying, I want to request the hello path. And then you get your hello world message. Um, it might be a specific image, you know, whatever you're actually requesting. If path is blank, we call that the root path or the path that's just slash. And that typically means give me index.html. Give me your root HTML uh, page and uh, just give me your website. Give me the, the first response to your website. Uh, path is something you'll have to code quite a bit. Uh, your server is going to start looking like if this path do this, else if this path do this, else if this path do this, et cetera. Query strings comes after the path. If uh, query strings and fragments are both optional, if there is a question mark in the path or in the URL, that indicates the start of a query string, which implies that you cannot have question marks in your paths or your domain names. Uh, a question mark is a very special character which says this is the beginning of a query string. And a query string is a specifically formatted key value, uh, set of key value pairs, which is going to add extra information to the request. So for example, this is how Google and DuckDuckGo handle search queries. If you'll have a query string, Q for what the query actually is, and then whatever you typed in the search bar. So if you look at the requests, the actual URL that was requested when you sent, uh, sent a Google search or a DuckDuckGo search, you'll see that query string in the request. Alternatively, if you want to make a search without using the search box for whatever reason, I don't know, I ain't going to question it, you can go right to the URL. You can go to your, uh, uh, I'm blank on what it's called, the, the big URL box at the top of your browser. You can go right there and type in your query by manually typing in the query string, and it'll have the same effect as if you uh, as if you use that box. A more reasonable application of that is you want to write some software that sends uh, search uh, that sends searches to Google or DuckDuckGo or your favorite search engine. You can do that programmatically. You could make a desktop app that sends those requests, though Google would probably get mad if you're not using their front end. So uh, they might detect that and shut you down at some point. But it's something you could do. And fragment, if you have a hashtag, that indicates the start of a fragment. And this is typically used for navigation. So for example, on Wikipedia is a site that takes advantage of, of fragments. If you have a fragment, you can have a URL that goes to a specific part, a specific section of the Wikipedia page. So you want to send somebody a Wikipedia article. It's got like 20 sections, and you're only interested in the 15th section. Like That's what you want to send them. Uh, you wouldn't just send them the URL. That's going to take them to the top of the page. And then you have to say, scroll down about three quarters of the way, blah, blah, blah. Send them the link with the fragment that scrolls, loads the page, and then scrolls to that fragment. Uh, make it easier for people. So fragment is a good way to handle that. Uh, and if you, like, if you want to do that, if you're sending Wikipedia links to anyone, uh, the table of contents at the top that has all the links for all the sections if you click one of those links, it's exactly what it's doing. It's adding the fragment to your URL and then scrolling to that fragment. So if you click on it in the table of contents and then cut and paste the link and send it to somebody, it'll go to that specific section. So when somebody sends you a request, how are we going to handle this in our servers? Well, we're going to speak this protocol which is going to be formatted like thus. Whenever you get an HTTP request, it's going to look something like this for either a GET or a POST request. The first line, and this is where our string parsing comes in. This is a lot of what you'll be doing on your homework assignments and throughout the whole semester. The first line 
where line is defined by a, a sequence of characters ending with slash r slash n. New lines are not just slash n in HTTP. One of the most important, they'll probably be the uh, lecture question on Friday is what's a new line in HTML? Slash r slash n. Uh, it's from the old days of printers. R is a carriage return, getting the printer, uh, the carriage, which is the thing that hits the letters, bringing that back to the beginning of the line, and then new line is moving it down to the next line. So it's an old archaic artifact from the old days of printers, of actual physical typewriter, uh, typewriter printers. Um, but that's what it is, and we're stuck with it, so we, got, we just got to deal with it. It's part of the protocol. It's not going to change. So up until the first slash r slash n, the first line is going to be specifically formatted with three parts separated by spaces, which implies that there can be no spaces in the actual content of each of these three parts. So for example, your path, the center one, a path cannot contain spaces because that's how we parse the protocol. So we have three values. First, the request method get, post, put, delete, head, whatever method we have. There are more. I forget what the other ones are. I don't know if that's a comprehensive list. Those are, those are the ones I end up using. Um, path, which is the entire path from the URL, from the path all the way to the end of the fragment. So if there's a query string, if there's a fragment, those are both included in this path. And finally, the HTTP version. For our purposes in this course, it's always going to be HTTP 1.1. You can just assume that that's a fact. And if you don't want to parse that and check if it's 1.1 in your homework, that's fine. I, I'm OK with that. There's enough stuff to do in this course. I don't have to have you check in HTTP versions. We're always going to use 1.1. After that line, there's going to be the, those three values, then a slash r slash n. So in your homework, look for slash r slash n. Everything before the first slash r slash n or uh, carriage return line feed, uh, CRLF. You'll see that in the documentation. The first CRLF, take that string, separate it by spaces, and then pull those three values out of that information. Now you have the most important things, request method and path, to figure out how you're handling this request. What is, this, what is the user requesting? What's the client requesting here? In this case, it's a get request for the root path. So I know that they're looking for my root HTML. They're looking for uh, cc312.html, whatever I name my file, index.html I might have, whatever it's called. After that first line, the request line, there's going to be any number of header fields, which are key value pairs with the key and value separated by a colon and an optional space. So we can have any number of headers, the name of the header, the host, host in this case, colon, an optional space, and then the value of that header, of course. Then the value of that header, followed by a carriage return line feed. So here are the host, cc312.com, content length, content type. Any number of those headers, key value pairs, that's an optional space. So when you separate by colon, the, the uh, idea, the strategy anyway, take the whole line, split it on colon, and on the value, strip out any leading or trailing white space to be able to get rid of that optional uh, space. I've always seen headers with that space, but according to the protocol, it's optional. It, can't, it might be there, it might not. Strip out white space, and then you're following the protocol the way it's designed. You're actually implementing HTTP instead of just, uh, well, this is how most browsers do it, so I'm OK if I only work in Chrome and not the other browsers that might not do that. Uh, we don't play that game. We implement the protocol as written, and then we know it's going to work on every Every properly written browser, I have to add that, Firefox. Oh. Um, there is, uh, on the course website, I link to the official documentation, the RFC. Actually, I think I, I think I talk about that on Friday. I will talk about that on Friday if I don't have it in the slides. But I'm pretty sure I do. The RFC is the actual definition of the protocol. That is your final answer on everything to do with 
uh, everything to do with these protocols, go to the RFC. The RFC will tell you exactly what the right answer is. And then the body of the request, if this is a post request or a commonly put request, or any request that has information that's being sent to the server, there's going to be a blank line. You can identify that blank line by slash r slash n slash r slash n. Oh, uh, CRL, I'll call it CRLF because I can pronounce that better. CRLF, CRLF. It's going to be two of those n line characters. Once you see that, you know you're done with headers and you're ready to start parsing the body. Even if there's no body, this request will end in a CRLF, CRLF. There will be two, uh, two new lines or a blank line. There will be, very importantly, a blank line right here and then the end of the bytes. So once you see a blank line, you know that's the start of the body of the request, and that's whatever the client's sending to you. If there is a body to the request, you're going to have two required headers, content length and content type. Yeah, CRLF, carriage return line feed, slash r slash n. Uh, those are all the same thing. Those are all the same exact thing. If I say CRLF, if I say line feed carriage return, oh, carriage return line feed, sorry, um, or slash r slash n, those are all the same thing. They're just different ways of saying the same exact thing. So any of those are, uh, are identical. Uh, and they all mean new line uh, colloquially. But they're a little different in, uh, uh, in HTTP, so we have to call them something fancy. Uh, so you have these two required headers. If there's a body, this includes post requests, put requests, and the very first from the very first objective, you have to care about these because and it includes any time you're sending information to the client. So whenever you're responding, so the client requests, hey, give me your HTML, and you're sending your HTML, you have to include content length and content type, required headers. Content length is the length of the content. It's the length of the content of the body only of the response. Everything after the blank line and very importantly, we'll talk about this quite a bit, very importantly, that's the length in bytes, not the length in characters. Some characters contain multiple bytes. That will be a big deal starting with objective two on the homework. Uh, there are some, a lot of characters, most characters, that contain multiple bytes. This needs to be the content length in bytes, not in the length of the string. And then content type. Tell me what kind of type this is that gives the browser, tells the browser, hey, this is HTML, hey, this is JSON in this case, hey, this is CSS, hey, this is an image, et cetera. Uh, those two headers are required whenever there is a body to the request or to the response. So the first thing you need to do with your server is parse these things. Get your string parsing on, look for all the key pertinent pieces of information, and read these requests. Your next step is going to be to write the HTTP response, which is going to be very similar to the request. There are only slight differences. Most of the protocol is the same for requests and for responses. There's not much I want to say on this slide. Why do I have this slide? So the response, headers are the same format, blank line, uh, body is the same format. The only difference is the very first line, which is going to be the response line or the status line, I think uh, it's sometimes called. This line is going to have the same kind of format as the request, where it's one single line with three values separated by spaces but the values are a little bit different and a little bit different order. The first thing is the HTTP version, 
Again, always HTTP 1.1 for our cases. So every single response your server sends, every HTTP response would start with those characters, those uh, eight, those eight, nine characters, including the space. Every response is going to start with those nine characters. Next is the response code. This tells the browser, the client, uh, how things went. 200 is the most common one you'll, you'll see and the most common one you'll serve. This means everything went great. Here's what you asked for, uh, 200. And then the human readable message corresponding to that code. So 200, usually known as an OK response, 200 is just a number that the computers understand. And most of us, it, it, uh, web developers, at some point, you'll just learn the codes. Uh, and then the human readable message, strictly for humans. And this message can actually contain spaces. So when the browser is parsing these, it looks for the first two spaces. And everything after the second space is the response text. Uh, and then everything else is the same as requests. So your first job, get a request, parse it. And then your second job is to put together a response and send it back to the client in these formats. Yeah. So on your homework for Specifically, the, 30, the 302 redirect, I have you put a content length of zero uh, because Firefox is dumb. <laughs> that's the only reason. So, And that's only for the redirect. Uh, everything else is fine. But on the redirect, for some reason, if you don't have a content length, Firefox will just hang. I don't know why. Firefox, I, I've looked at everything I can think of. As far as I can tell, Firefox is in the wrong here. But to avoid confusion, just add the content length of zero. Uh, there are a handful of response codes. Did I not even have put 302 on here? Oh, yeah, I'm out of time anyway. A um, handful of response codes, you can look at those. And we'll pick up with HTTP on Friday.